The North West has one of the richest histories in Britain, but as archaeologists, we've only just scratched the surface. In every town, village and city, there are traces of undiscovered ruins, legendary people and artefacts just inches beneath our feet, waiting to be found. This series goes in search of lost treasures and shows you how you can get involved and possibly unearth some of the biggest mysteries in history. This is about the archaeology that you, the people, can go out and discover. It's about the things that you have in your own neighbourhood and, in many cases, in your own houses. This is the archaeology of the people, and you never know what you're going to turn up next. Incredibly, a short distance away from this ultra-modern retail park is an ancient place, which has played out some of the most violent events in history from the Dark Ages to the English Civil War. Our journey starts three miles north of the former industrial centre of Warrington in a small township called Winnick, which had witnessed some epic events from British history. Winnick Church sits on a mound overlooking the main north-south A49, an ancient routeway from prehistoric times. A Roman road passes close by, but it was the position of the church in particular which intrigued me. Four thousand years ago, all you would have heard on this spot is the gentle lull of carts passing and horses, but at this point it's considerably different. There are still, however, islands of tranquility and history in this mad, mad world, and this is one of them. This is Winnick Church, and we're about to go and investigate. When we encounter sites like this, they invariably sit on top of things which are much older, and the church at Winnick began on a prehistoric mound. And in this instance, you can still see that mound sat here with the church on top of it. visiting ancient sites like churches, it's always a good idea to speak to local experts. Historian Frank Bryce told me about the time the tombs of medieval knights in the Gerard Chapel were opened up. Stone there, which looks as though it had a handle in. Right. So we got some That's... professional excavators in, and they lifted the stone up, and they said, lots of lead-lined coffins, goodness knows what down there, but we came back at lunchtime, and they're excavating on their own account. So I was digging a lot and said, that's it, close it. We're not finding anything else. So you don't know. So we don't so know what's other down than there. the lead ones and there were some leather coffins yeah. as well, weren't there? I was I was thinking perhaps we might even find Piers Gerard's suits oh, of armour and things that'd like that. Would be superb. So yeah. nobody really knows what's down there. No, no, except there's a lot of people down there. It was at this point, as I remembered, I had read a reference in a Victorian history book mentioning a Stone Age burial, possibly being sited here long before Winnick Church existed. It's possible that the tombs Frank told me about were not the only bodies buried under Winnick Church. We're down at the altar end of the church, and this is a fascinating part of the building. As part of the reconstruction process, in 1849, they brought in A.W. Pugin, most famous for his work at the Houses of Parliament, to design the church at this end, the tiles and the ceiling. This is the end of the church that went derelict after the English Civil War. The medieval uh, chapel that was standing here just became ruinous. And they decided they were going to construct something here in the 1820s. And while they were digging, came upon this huge mound of stones. And as they punched through the mound of stones, they came down at a depth of about 10 feet or so on a chamber containing skeletons. Now, with our knowledge now of archaeology, we know that these skeletons were more than likely prehistoric. Um, so right under my feet are, or were, the chambers containing the Winnick Giants, three skeletons in excess of seven feet high. 
What the Victorians had stumbled upon was probably a barrow or raised burial mound, possibly dating from the late Stone Age over 5,000 years ago. That may be the ancient reason why Winnick Church sits on this particular area of raised ground. And somewhere under here is where the skeletons were. So let's have a go and see if we can find them. Here we are. No, I'm not warm at all, so I think we might have to go back a bit here. So if we kind of work back in the direction I came in. See, the other problem you've got here as well is there's a large convergence of energy lines, ley lines and things on, on the Winnick Mound R. Now I'm getting a register. There we go, there we go. That wobble just tells me that I'm now where I want to be. Now, nobody's exactly sure how that movement works. It could be because of the electrical impulses in the human body, so it's moving the body, or it could be something in the environment that moves the bob itself. This works on a tremble. It's, it's totally independent. See how it's, it's, it's kind of wobbling on, on itself? So the actual bob itself is moving, but the string isn't. There you go. Whoa, there you are. There it is. There, whoa. That is exactly where those burials were sighted now. I'm, I'm exactly over them. One of Winnick's lost treasures that few people know about today is the 16th century bell tower. The current custodian of the clock winds the clock and bell mechanism a total of 400 revolutions twice a week. It's one of the last remaining hand-wound clock mechanisms in the northwest. It moves every half a minute. And that's the quarter past the hours that. When that goes round to the, the 60, there's a cam at the back here, right? It lifts that arm up, and that moves, and it just... The bells were recast in 1600 and have been ringing out across Winnick Parish for over 400 years. In prehistoric times, people clearly respected the Winnick site and built a series of burial mounds in the surrounding area, dating from about 3000 BC onwards. Amazingly, the pattern and alignment of the Winnick Mound and these neighbouring mounds seems to follow the famous Avebury Stone Circle in Wiltshire. Both are centred on ancient crossroads surrounded by burial mounds to the northeast, and a Christian church has been built later within the site. So what would Winnick have looked like? We're here in the middle of a housing estate in a place called Parkfields. Not the sort of place you'd expect to find a stone circle, at least not one on this scale. This is one constructed in the 1970s and it's a perfect reproduction of the sort of circle that you would have found on Winnick back in the Stone Age. It does give a fantastic idea of what the top of the mound at Winnick would have looked like when it had something like this sat on it. The Winnick Stone Circle would have been a prominent feature in the landscape, and the Bronze Age burial mounds appeared to be aligned with it on a northeast axis to the rising and setting sun and moon. In the 1980s, a rescue archaeology team were called in to excavate one of the burial mounds close to the neighbouring village of Croft. The main feature discovered was a slot in the middle of the first mound, possibly the site of a standing stone erected as a marker. Archaeologists also discovered evidence of a wooden structure, possibly an early Bronze Age sanctuary or observatory, like Woodhenge near Avebury in Wiltshire, which burnt down in about 1520 BC. A second massive mound was built on top of this, with even more burials added. The positions of burials again suggest a northeast-southwest alignment, which may correspond to a heavenly marker such as the sun and moon. About 2,000 years later, in around 600 AD, the site suddenly expanded. Burials stretched out in all directions to as many as two or even three thousand bodies, all of which had dissolved in the acidic soil. Many burials had the typical Christian alignment with feet pointing east-west, suggesting a post-Roman Christian or perhaps even an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. 
Amazingly, this burial site had been used continuously for over 4,500 years, from very ancient times right up to the present day. What's the worst thing you could possibly imagine happening to a four and a half thousand year old sacred burial site? Well, this is it. It's the M6 motorway, and most of the site was sand quarried away to get hardcore for this. And even worse than that, what was left of it in the field behind me, you can see the uh, artificial mound that's been placed where the original one was, and they're now trenching it to drop pipes in as well. It's a good example of uh, a little bit of um, industrial disrespect, shall we say, for ancient sites. It's a shame it could have been one of the most important sites in the north of England. It's entirely gone. The big question, though, was what could account for the huge increase in bodies from around 600 AD onwards. The legend of a mighty Saxon battle in the area suddenly seemed to gain a lot of credence. Here in the northwest, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles tell of a violent Dark Age battle between two opposing Saxon armies at Makerfield near Winnick. The young King Oswald of Northumbria fought his older rival, King Pender of Mercia, now present-day Cheshire and the Midlands. Pender won the battle and Oswald was slain and his forces scattered. Weapons expert Mike Lodes takes up the story. When Pender brought his army to face Oswald, what you had was two armies of almost identical composition, with Gazith, the great Saxon warriors, heavily armed. They've got mail shirts, helmets, shields, and spears. And they would fight shoulder to shoulder in the shield wall with interlocked shields. How do you get through that? How do you burst through? One of the things that characterized the early stages of such warfare was missile warfare, trying to make a hole. The spear was not for throwing. This was for reach, for fighting over the shield wall. What they used for throwing were little like javelins. So you would start by this barrage of javelins being thrown. They also had throwing axes. These are called Franciscas. You would be going in and you would throw these and then as you'd got the enemy off balance with that, rush in for your attack. They weren't exclusive to the Franks, the Saxons had them as well. But the Saxons also had another weapon that was eponymous to their name, and that is the sax, a little hunting knife. But it could also be used in battle as last resort. The main weapon of the Saxons was, of course, their sword. And they were handed down from father to son. In fact, they even gave their swords names. They were called Legbiter or Bloodletter, wonderfully evocative names for a hero culture. They would fight until the last man standing. For them, death was an honor to be sought rather than a fate to be feared. Was the large number of bodies found nearby evidence of this Saxon battle cemetery? We'll never know for sure, but amazingly, Winnick Church holds another vital clue to the authenticity of this battle site. The medieval structure is still visible. We've still got the columns, we've got the window behind me set into the medieval wall. But the columns are really important because of the bases that they stand on. The bases are the footprint of the earlier building. The pre-medieval building had columns which looked like this. We can see clearly depicted here on the early bases what appear to be Roman or possibly Saxon columns from a building that was here before the one we see now. And then here, we see King Oswald with his war helmet, but in a style of carving which is reminiscent of the 400s, the 500s and the 600s, and very rare indeed. Everywhere in the church, there are numerous references to King Oswald. There are many carvings, as well as a recent Victorian stained glass window depicting Oswald. 
More importantly, part of a huge stone cross was found buried on the site. The cross has been dated to the 8th century and provides vital clues to how Oswestry got its name and the legend of St Oswald's sacred well. This arm we have behind us is the centre portion here with the boss in the middle, and that's what we're actually looking at. I rather favour that the stonemasons that actually produced this were the ones that stayed on after Oswald's death because of the panels in the end. These are copies of them. You've actually got here a cross with a Celtic chapel in the background. Then you have a gentleman here identified as a priest because it has another cross here that seems to be in association with him. And he's carrying a bell, which indicates it's the bell of St. Anthony, so that's the church we're in, dedicated to St. Anthony, and a bucket, which presumably contains water from Oswald's well. So we know that by the time that this thing was actually cons uh, constructed and carved in the 7 and 800s uh, AD period, the well was already in use. The well was a recognised site. But the cross actually goes a little bit further. It can be used as a piece of detective work to reconcile the legends of Oswald together. This is the panel from the other end of the cross, and on this panel we see the defeated King Oswald here being suspended upside down um, and being disemboweled by two of Penda's warriors. Now, this is the famous legend that carries us to Oswestry, where Oswald's tree was supposedly situated. That's where they took the body of Oswald and chopped him up into little bits. So we've got both of the, the Oswald stories contained um, on a cross arm here, which I think is fairly conclusive evidence that this is the site that Oswald was defeated with the Battle of Makerfield. The legend says that when King Oswald was slain, he clawed for his sword, and there water mysteriously gushed from the ground. Well, somewhere in this field is one of the oldest sacred sites in the Mersey Valley. Oh, here we go. It dates back to 642 AD and the death of King Oswald. And it's the well. The only snag is it's really difficult to find. The trouble with looking for wells is that you could always go for the obvious, I suppose, and, and head for the pond, but I don't think that's really where this one is. Uh, this time of year is difficult to find things like this because the grass gets long. It's literally like looking for a, a needle in a haystack. At some point, the farmer put a fence round it to stop his cows going in. Oh, I say, here we go, this looks a bit more like it. Oh, gosh, this certainly looks promising. Let's have a look at what we've got here. Oh, there you go. Yes, we've got a chamber that appears to be filled with water. Uh, the only problem is, that's not what you would necessarily expect to find. It's a well, and it's full of water, but when they came up here with some children to do a sort of mini history of Winnick years ago, apparently on the back of the well, there was a date visible, 1611. But that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is a well of 642 AD, where for over 1,460 years, pilgrims have removed soil for healing purposes. That's gonna leave a bit more of a hole than what we've got here, I think. So it's interesting, it's a well, and it's the Oswald's well of today, but it's not the one we're looking for. Well, this is more like it. This is a hole the size of an entire field. Absolutely enormous. And this is what you'd expect to happen if pilgrims came here for 1,460 years, removing the healing earth. It's on the opposite side of the road to the well we looked at earlier, which kind of suggests that this could be the spot where King Oswald died in 642 AD, clawed the ground, and then pilgrims are just removing the soil from that time onwards. It certainly feels more like it. It's got that sort of dark age atmosphere about it. You can almost feel him falling to the ground and crawling for his sword at this spot. <laughs> Almost exactly a thousand years later, another great battle occurred at Red Bank, just outside Winnick, during the English Civil War in 1648. 
Scottish Royalist forces numbering 24,000 men under the Duke of Hamilton were cut off by Cromwell's troops and had to fight a running battle for 30 miles as they retreated south from Preston. The Battle of Red Bank was a containing battle. It was to try and hold off Cromwell and the parliamentarians to win time for the bulk of the Scottish Royalist Army, or what remained of it, to maybe regroup and refresh themselves at Warrington and cross the Mersey at Warrington Bridge, which was the last bridgeable point of the Mersey. So they found this point where they could defend the road, where it was defended either side by the natural features, where they stood a chance of holding off Cromwell's men for a few hours, maybe, to buy time for their colleagues further south to regroup at Warrington and get into Cheshire across the Mersey. Cromwell's forces overwhelmed the Scots and a thousand men were massacred in a single day. Following the Battle of Red Bank, the two forces continued to pursue each other down towards Winnick Church. The Royalists fortified the church, the parliamentarians came marching up the road. So a firefight ensued between the tower and the forces on the road below. And you can still to this day see where the lead balls from the muskets smacked into the tower. There's a mark over here. Anyway, the snipers were positioned on top of the tower, shooting down onto the parliamentarians. A firefight ensued between the two forces. And needless to say, the Royalists returned fire. And one guy was actually shot off the tower. One mystery has puzzled me for years. Whatever happened to the church treasure at Winnick after the English Civil War? Frank Bryce told me of one intriguing theory that the treasure may have been hidden in a secret cavity before Cromwell and his troops arrived. We, we think this was the doorway into the treasure, but <laughs> what happens, we put a camera through the wall Down there. and we find it's very thin. So it and uh, it just leads into the tower inside. So on the other side of this, presumably, was the floor part way up where the bell ringers would have stopped. That's it, and it's no longer there. Yeah. It's a tempting thought, but perhaps this is a lost treasure that we'll never actually find. Who'd have thought that Winnick, one of thousands of ordinary places in the Northwest, holds so many clues to our secret history, lost treasures which are just beneath the surface waiting to be rediscovered. <laughs>